So thank you, Stephen. And um, I won't need to go to church this Sunday. I've already got my sermon under the belt. Um, we're going to try and um, move this along reasonably swiftly and bring the audience into it. First of all, though, I think everyone in the audience, could you give a round of applause to the uh, candidates who have chosen to come here today? <laughs> Thank you very much. And just moving from the far end down, if one person from each party or independent, you, we've got three minutes, just explain who you are, why you're here, and what you're trying to do. Thanks, John. Okay, so I'm Robert Knight, the uh, Progressives candidate for Canberra. Uh, the Australian Progressives are a new party. We've been around since 2014. We formed out of the March and March movement. That's where the, the, the origins of our party come from. Basically, a field of people who are sick of the status quo and don't find a natural home in any of the three major parties. So we've basically come together and formed a group who are interested in a pragmatic centre of the road, although we do tend to leave left, uh, approach towards politics. Uh, politics. Our, our, our overriding um, focus is to bring integrity and ethics back into politics. Just really quickly, I'm Therese Faulkner, um, also um, Australian Progressives candidate for Bean. Um, just to um, 10 seconds of words, uh, really uh, upset about the lack of long term vision, long term planning um, in the parliament at the moment and the erosion of uh, ethical conduct. So that's been a, a real driver for me wanting to get in there and do something about it. Thank you, Therese. My name is Jamie Christie. I was born in Canberra. I have worked in Canberra for 30 years as a doctor. I'm a, I, I was until Monday last week a senior staff specialist in emergency medicine with appointments at both Calgary and Canberra. Um, sometime around November um, last year, there were a couple of things and I'm just saying, surely, surely someone could do a better job. And it occurred to me at some point that, you know, if not, I, one cannot um, hope that somebody else will do stuff one needs to take up and I in fact was in a position to be able to resign my job and um, campaign. I'm standing as an independent in the electorate of Bean. Um, I, emergency medicine is a very pragmatic specialty with a sort of time focus. Um, I believe that we need to win our economy off its fossil fuel dependency within the next decade if at all possible. Um, and I am completely open to any strategy that would do that, except at the moment possibly the eco-fascists. I don't feel that that's quite where we need to be going. Um, and then, sort of politically, for this audience I would say, I am I feel that Australia is at risk of drifting into a sort of neo-fascist state with a group in power who fairly tightly control the resources and a sort of somewhat slightly narcly disenfranchised general populace, and I think that is not the kind of society that I'd like to live in. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Anthony Pesek, uh, born and raised in Canberra, uh, did my studies in Sydney, worked as a civil engineer in infrastructure for a number of years and then uh, somehow ended up in London post an MBA working for an investment bank, uh, kind of didn't like it too much, uh, moved to Croatia which is where my parents originally came from, chasing the sun, uh, lived there for 10 years, set up a corporate finance consultancy uh, which I thought I'd be busy with for a couple of years and stayed for a decade. Uh, moved back to Canberra four years ago and have founded a renewable energy business that's based here in Canberra but works nationally. Uh, renewable energy is a perfect blend of my engineering and finance skills. It's been something that I've been investing in for 15 years and I've ordinarily been a Liberal voter. I have voted Labor, um, but in light of the shenanigans in um, recent years with constant toppling of Prime Ministers, mostly related to energy policy or lack thereof, um, it's compelled me to do what I'm doing now, which is running as an independent for the Senate. Uh, I think that uh, based on the composition of the next Senate, the crossbench will be a very, very important part of policy making in Australia, uh, more so than the independents that are running at a lower house. And uh, I want to be part of that because uh, energy is something I know of. It's uh, something that shouldn't be ideologically battled, which it has been for recent years. It's a science-based and economics-based uh, discussion and Australia can have for every reason under the sun a clean energy future. Um, I'm, I'm an example of that, I'm someone who works in this field. Um, so that's one of the main reasons I've been compelled to do this just very briefly. The other one is I think that Canberra needs independent representation in the Senate when it comes to party matters such as decentralisation, 
our current senators do not cross the floor on these issues. We've, it's been years since we've seen that bravery in our Senate uh, with Gary Humphreys who did this on the issue of territory rights. Um, so I think that, and I hope that Canberrans see the merits in an independent who can represent Canberra's interests without any obligation whatsoever to the parties. My name's um, Nicholas Houston and I'm a local solicitor and I've, um, I've operated my own business in the area of migration. I'm a migration lawyer essentially. And um, one of the things that got me into doing this was that I was working for the Department of Immigration in 2002 when the TAMPA appeared. And um, it was my job to excise legally, so lawyer excise those offshore islands, and that was the place where the asylum boats were seeking to land. And it was the issue of the children overboard. And um, the, the government said, what kind of people would throw um, their own kids overboard to manipulate us, the poor Australian government? And then they, that, that unleashed some 20 years of refugee rhetoric as we've known it. But at that point I thought, I'm not gonna continue to work even as a humble bureaucrat for these people who, who essentially have lied their way to electoral victory. And at that point I started doing the politics. I left Canberra, I went over to Mexico City. I lived there for five years and um, set up an independent migration agency. I've come back to Canberra and I've run the business for the last 15 years. Um, in terms of our agenda, so I'm the convener of the Democratic Reform Alliance, and that essentially is a, a party that wants to focus on the issues of corruption within the political system. I sort of come out of, out of the closet, I'm prepared to say that a lot of politics in Australia is basically corrupt, and it comes down to the way that the parties are funded. You know, both of the major parties and the National Party are awash in corporate funding, and they also get um, subsidies from the taxpayer. And in, in effect, that means that they no longer need to represent the voters because they've got their money, they've got their party donors, it controls the platform of the party, it controls the people who gain pre-selection, it controls the careers of those people in the parliament and what happens to them when they leave the parliament. So there's very little point in being a member of a major political party any now, anymore. They're not democratic organisations and the, the system is fairly corrupt. And when you look at the things that have been happening, um, for example, um, the fact that Liberal Party donors then get awarded huge significant government contracts without proper scrutiny, if you look at the, the travel entitlements fraud and the lack of accountability on that level, if you look at appointments and the number of appointments that are made without any process at all, and if you look to see whether anyone's ever pulled to account, the answer is no. I mean, the system is, the system is actually fairly corrupt and the, the fact of that means that a lot of these people and a lot of these issues never get a run. We can't actually get a run for different sorts of issues because of the fact that we can't deal with the issue of money. In the, in the system. So what we're, we've got a very narrow focus and that is on essential transparency issues and um, anti-corruption issues and we're looking for votes from the right and the left um, to run this agenda which until our agenda can be successful then it's going to be very difficult for anything progressive ever to get through. So that's the point of the Democratic Reform Alliance. Thanks. Hi, my name is Penny Hibbers and I'm very excited to be running for the Senate for the Greens at this election. I'm actually going to give most of my our time to Tim to introduce um, himself and our party. But very quickly, um, I'm a lecturer at ANU in computer science, I'm taking a break now obviously to, to do this full time. Um, and uh, I'm, a, I'm a feminist, I'm an innovator, I'm a creative person and technologist. Um, and I'm very passionately driven by action on climate change. Um, bringing refugees here and also integrity in politics. Thanks so much. Um, so I also want to, to start actually by acknowledging that we are here on Indigenous land, on the land of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, um, and they've never ceded sovereignty over this land. And it's very important that when we're talking about politics in Australia, we acknowledge that we are on stolen land. Um, so my name's Tim Hollow and I'm running for the Greens for the new seat of Canberra. Um, and it's a really interesting and exciting opportunity. There's so many conversations going on around Canberra at the moment, here on this stage, but out in the community, about the fact that our politics is not working at the moment. Our politics seems incapable of dealing with the most fundamental issues that we face, whether it be climate change, whether it be uh, education funding, whether it be um, the, the critical issues of good governance and integrity in governance. And these are issues that the Greens have been focusing on now for a generation. We put these issues firmly on the agenda, we bring them into the Parliament, into the Senate, and for the last three terms into the House through, the, through Adam Bant in the seat of Melbourne. We keep them on the agenda and we pull the political conversation in that direction. That's the incredibly important role that the Greens play. 
For me personally, climate change has been next. Parliament is the one which must put us on track to complete decarbonisation. We do not have any more time for delays and we don't have any more time for half measures. And so the critical role... Thank you. The critical role that the Greens can play is at an election where it seems almost certain that we're going to get a change of government and thank goodness for that. We can work with a Labor Party which has moved a fair way on climate change and pull them towards more solid action on coal and more. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Alicia Payne and I'm thrilled to be Labor's candidate for the seat of Canberra. And I'd also like to begin by paying my respects to the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people and their elders past, present and emerging. I think we have a really important choice, Australia has a really important choice at this election between the Liberal National Coalition that is looking into the past, it has no plan for health, for education, for wages, and Labor, who is looking at a positive, inclusive vision for our country. In our budget reply, our centrepiece was about investing $2.3 billion into Medicare so that cancer patients no longer face out-of-pocket costs for their uh, scans and specialist fees. Um, we've announced some of the biggest investments in affordable housing and in public education in the history of Australia. And we are the only, co uh, only party that will deliver the action we need on climate change. And we've announced our policy in full uh, last week on that. Um, I'm really aware that this is a really important issue for Canberrans. It's raised with me more than any other and it's important to me as well. Uh, I've grown up in Canberra. I've spent uh, all of my life here except for when I studied in Sydney also. Um, and I've been driven in my career by social justice. Uh, I studied economics because I wanted to understand better how we distribute income and how we can do that more fairly. And I started off as a researcher at NATSEM, um, looking at issues of poverty, inequality and the impact of policy on households. I've also worked as a public servant at the Treasury and most recently as part of the opposition team as a senior advisor to Bill Shorten and Chief of Staff to Jenny Macklin. And I was proud to be part of that team to fight against the cuts and uh, demonisation of anyone receiving social security in our country and that's a key um, driver for me. So I know Canberra is a caring and progressive community and ACT Labor is a very progressive part of our party and I'd be really proud uh, to represent and hope I get the opportunity to represent that community in both our caucus and our parliament. Thank you. Okay everyone, thank you very much for those uh, opening remarks. We're going to start with a question from the audience and the first question I'd like to be one that can go to all of the panellists and then we'll alternate through specific questions for the, uh, the candidates. So um, hands up in the air if you've got a question. Yes, sir. Um, as a proud Canberran, and um, I'm sure we all are, um, I want to know what each of the candidates sees as an important investment in Canberra, um, in our city. Um, the current federal coalition um, is not doing all that much for our city, and we essentially have an anti-Canberra minister, the Minister for Decentralisation, um, and certainly Sir Robert Menzies will be turning in his grave. Um, what do you guys, as candidates, Okay, just in response, first we'll keep this to two minutes each and we'll start with Therese and bring it along and we'll keep rotating it through so everyone gets a alternate Therese. <laughs> Thanks very much for that question. Um, <clears throat> I'm also a, a very proud Canberran, uh, having grown up here since I was four years old. Um, in terms of the Australian progressives, we see one of the, the big investments we need to make is in long-term planning and it, real investment in um, transport infrastructure and that sort of thing we think will really um, benefit Canberra. I will pass to Rob as um, the urban planning king. He's going to have a go? No, oh, okay. All right, sorry. I, I thought it was just one party. <laughs> no, no. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I guess I'm, there's a bit of a crossover between federal issues and, and local ACT issues. Um, one of the, uh, the things that the Australian Progressives is very keen on is that if we look after people, people look after the economy. And so in Canberra, I can see there's um, a, a real need to provide some, some jobs for our school leavers, so especially for the unskilled workers. Like there's, there's, there's plenty of um, 
plenty of work around, I think, for those who've been to university and, and can get um, jobs in the, in the federal ACT public service. But what about the sorts of jobs where we can look after our parks and gardens, our open spaces, provide those opportunities for kids coming out of school, take pride in the local community, and again, if you invest in those jobs as a government, those jobs then will create an economy that, that works for all of us. Um, so I'm standing as an independent for Bean, which is the newer electorate, so uh, south of Pine Marsh and west of the Parkway. Um, my feeling about, I mean, Canberra is essential. I was, I, I'm proud to, I'm very happy to live in Canberra. I'm proud, so I'm aggressive. Um, I, my grandfather arrived in Canberra in 1928. My father would have been born in Canberra. My grandmother refused to live in a tent, um, so he was born in Queenby, and I was born in Canberra. Um, the, the central industry here is the Federal Public Service, um, but there were no complaints when John Howard removed 30,000 jobs from the Federal Public Service. I think that Barnaby Joyce has demonstrated that specialist services that already exist are rooted in a series of networks and you cannot just transplant them and plonk them regionally. Um, I think that um, much meaningful dialogue happens in corridors rather than in um, you know, formal meetings or via video links that we've already set up and that often sets the stage for what actually can end up being developed. So I would strongly support maintaining as much as possible as the of the federal um, mechanisms and the public sector within Canberra. Um, there is still some role for decentralisation and how you balance that. Um, I agree, I think you want a more diverse economy than one industry um, and we really don't have that at the moment. I can see absolutely no reason why Canberra cannot follow the steps of, I think it's Lancaster City in California, which is run by an autocratic Republican mayor, but is now exporting net amounts of solar um, energy into the US grid. We have enough sunlight, you could do all the quality you want. And then you'd employ the tradies. <laughs> Um, as I mentioned before, I, I touched on decentralisation. Um, having lived away from Canberra for 23 years and lived in a number of different cities, now that I've returned here four years ago, I quite often find myself having to defend my choice being back in Canberra to friends overseas and to friends in Sydney. Um, seeing other countries, they're not... Most countries are proud of their nation's capital. And here in Canberra, there's... Uh, Canberra gets picked on quite a lot. Um, because of a continuous failure by the uh, Canberra Liberals to provide any reasonable choice uh, for voters here, we have an incumbent and fairly lazy uh, Labor government who have allowed uh, Canberra to primarily focus on Geocon developing their business with horrible apartments. Um, Canberra should be the nation's capital. It makes sense for our ministries to be here and to be in proximity to one another. Um, knowing from a Liberal perspective that there's no seats to be won here, credibly, um, say that given the uh, pull out of our um, contenders on oh, hello <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean uh, <laughs> good timing um, uh, we need independent representation <laughs> we need independent representation in the Senate to protect that um, for more Renewables. We have an industry that is imminent globally. We have prices that are now competing with new coal. Uh, this is the famous Kodak moment for Australia right now, where they're clutching onto coal, uh, when what we could be doing is developing and exporting clean energy, clean energy technology. So Canberra could be a good base for that as well. Um, okay, folks. Now, Minazaki has joined us. Um, we're just going to let the panelists finish their answers to this question, and then Mina can do her intro statement, and then we'll be back on the road. And I just... <laughs> <laughs> uh, not completely. What did he say? Uh, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he, said, he said he was very sad that but, you hadn't come. <laughs> but um, let's give Mina a big round of applause. Yes. For, for, being, for being the first Liberal candidate who has come to a Smiths candidate forum. And, uh, yes. Yes. Yes, well, why the Democratic Reform Alliance is a critique of corruption in the political system, the, the place of money in politics. We've also got a more positive agenda for extending democracy and um, trying to facilitate the greater participation of people in the political system. So one of the things, obviously, in Canberra that we need to push is better representation, because I think with um, 4, 430,000 people living in Canberra, we have two Senate representatives, whereas if you live in the smaller states, Tasmania or South Australia, they get vastly more representatives than we do. 
So that's essentially it's not it's it's a, it's not democratic the, the 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 way that we can participate in federal politics. So I'm sure that all of the candidates would agree that if there was more opportunity for us to get up, then they would be on board with supporting that. So that's one thing. The other thing that we want to do is call for plebiscites on these social issues, um, euthanasia, um, the decision to commit troops overseas, um, uh, whether we sign on to foreign treaties or not. These issues that have been blocked by the by the current politics, it's time to allow the people to speak on those issues. That'll affect camp. We're from a more liberal community than other parts of Australia. And I think it's time that we get a voice. We get a better voice in the federal parliament through better representation, and we get to speak up on some of these issues. So that's what um, we'll be looking to push. So we've got a really raw deal here in Canberra in terms of representation. As Nicola said, you know we're vastly underrepresented compared to the rest of the country in terms of how many senators we have, and you know also in the lower house if we compare it to Tasmania. Um, but you know going on from that, the representation that we do have is really failing us. So you know I'd actually want to listen to and represent the values of Canberrans. Um, obviously Senator Zedza Selja does not represent our wishes and he's directly gone against them in terms of things like marriage equality and voluntary assisted dying, thinking Peter Dutton's pretty good Prime Minister um, and all of those things but also you know both of the major parties take Canberra for granted because the Labour Party also thinks it's safe and that you know they don't have anything to worry about. Um, uh, you know, we we want to see the public service restored, which obviously you know goes a lot towards um, creating or restoring restoring jobs in Canberra. Uh, so our public sector underpins us being able to actually provide really world class public services in terms of education and healthcare. And you know, we want to um, we want to make sure all public schools have the funding that they need, and that would inject I think it's about sixty five million dollars into Canberra ACT schools over the next 10 years and we also want to have universal health care so kind of all of our national policies go to improving our foundational services here in Canberra so we want to make sure that everyone can access the health care that they need um, without having you know so much money going into propping up the the private health insurance um, machine we want that actually to go into public services so people can get the health care that they need including cancer treatment and everything else so i think it's important to note that canberra isn't a one-trick town our public service is incredibly important and the greens believe absolutely in supporting the public service we also have but in, in fact in this central electorate of Canberra, we have five university campuses. And Canberra is now almost as much a university town as it is a public service yeah. town. Um, the Greens really firmly believe in supporting our universities. We have a fantastic package of policies um, this term to inject um, $10 billion of funding, increased funding, per student funding, um, into our universities over the next um, five years. Um, to uh, And to use proper taxation of corporations to ensure that we can actually support our students with free undergraduate degrees, free TAFE, oh, and increasing yeah. student services. Um, so that is absolutely central to supporting Canberra. The other thing I'd briefly say in the tiny bit of time I imagine I have left is um, the cultural institutions here in Canberra are yeah. such a critical part of our city. Um, and at the moment, we're giving huge amounts of funding. Half a billion dollars is proposed to the War Memorial, while our National Gallery has leaking roofs, um, our our um, film and sound archive can't actually get through digitising its collection before it starts to fall apart. We really need to support our cultural institutions more broadly, um, and and also, yeah, thank you. And also, just the the other critical point here in Canberra is the is the transport infrastructure. Um, our city does get left behind; it gets ignored, um, and we need to support the transport infrastructure too. I'm really sick of seeing the public service treated uh, as a savings option and nothing more and as a punching bag for um, everyone around the country. Um, having grown up here, my dad, most of his career was in the public service and what I saw from him was, um, you know, that there's a real dedication in public service. They are some of the most professional and hardworking people around and having been one myself, I've seen that myself too. So Labor is going to stop the, the decentralisation and remove the additional efficiency dividend. And I think as well, I, I think that uh, a Labor government would also 
get back to treating the public service with respect and respecting their advice and asking for their policy advice more than has been happening. I think, um, you know, the public service is not the only thing uh, important for Canberra and we are diversifying and we, we need to, but it is a really important part of why we're here and why many of us actually move here. So we need to, to support it. Um, I think, you know, my vision for Canberra is a capital that we're all really proud of, that people want to come and visit. Uh, and I think we can see that in uh, Labor's announcement of 200 million for stage two of light rail, is that a shortened Labor government would really be getting behind our capital and taking that pride in it, um, uh, as, as it does around other places. Thanks. Okay, thanks folks. Um, Mina Zaki from the Liberal Party has joined us, and um, so we'll let her, if you can just, Mina, um, you've got... Um, what was the question? <laughs> uh, we're just going to the intro now, so if you could just explain oh. um, who you are, why you're running, what you hope to achieve for people in Canberra, um, and you've got three minutes on that. So is that what everyone else just did? Uh, they did that before you got here. Oh, sorry guys. <laughs> um, so I'm really sorry I was late. I have had a shocker of a headache today, and... Um, if I pass out, Diana knows me and she's got my contact details. Um, now, to begin, um, why am I standing? So, my name is Mina Zaki and I was born in Kabul, Afghanistan. I came to Australia when I was seven years old um, and my grandparents had come before me. Um, and so I've seen the worst of the world and the best of the world and I've chosen to live in Canberra. Now, I haven't had the privilege of being born here and that is a privilege. Um, but I chose to live here because I fell in love with the place. And I believe that over the past, for the longest time that I can think of, Canberra has not had a strong voice representing it. Full stop. Now, with my political views, the reason I'm, I'm a liberal is because I believe in individual freedoms, opportunities, and rights and responsibilities. The reason I believe in those things is because I've lived a life when I didn't have those things. So that's what makes me a liberal. I really value those rights and freedoms. Um, I also believe that individuals are born to be able to make decisions for themselves. They don't need government making those decisions for them. And so I don't believe in big government. I believe in very small government that's not meddling in people's uh, way. Uh, and just letting them cultivate their own path in life and helping them out when they need it but not standing in their way and preventing them with high taxes and you name it, control. Now, the reason why I'm standing for Canberra is because I'm sick and tired of this place being treated as the poor cousin of rural New South Wales. We are the nation's capital and we should be treated that way. Now, with all due respect to Gay Brockman, who I have an immense amount of respect for, unfortunately, she only addressed the Canberra bubble issue in her exit speech. That's not right. That's not fair. And I hope that whether I get in or any of these individuals get in, that they bring some respect back to Canberra. That's why I'm standing to be a strong voice and an advocate for Canberra. I didn't get a chance to answer that last question. I'm sorry, you, you're correct. Yes, yeah, thanks. Sorry. Cheers. So, um, <clears throat> I didn't really introduce myself at the start. My name's Robert, as I said. Uh, I'm a former army officer. I was born in Canberra and grew up here before I left to travel the world and uh, do army things. Um, my appreciation of Canberra is obviously um, through the lens of, of my military experience, and that is basically a, a central planning and coordination. Um, is, is vitally important when it comes to, to the delivery of public services. Having a public service decentralised in, in, in the way that this current LNP, or oh, sorry, the last LNP government uh, are working towards actually undermines that principle. So for me, in my military guys, that's a, it's a really uh, problematic um, arrangement. So I see um, 
we, we have to champion the public service. We have to uh, realise what it does for, for the country. Uh, it delivers the services that politicians are trying to direct, uh, or, sorry, they, it delivers the services as a result of their policies. Uh, if they try to cut it and they try to undermine it by moving it away from, from this place, then it's actually doing everyone a disservice. So the Australian progressives would stand for actually empowering Canberra to hold on to the public service. That aside, other things that we would look to do is obviously um, turn, turn Canberra into the jewel in the crown that it's meant to be. We're, we're, the, we're the capital of the country, uh, and you travel the world, and a lot of people don't understand what Canberra is. They think the capital of Sydney, I think it's a fairly common misconception. Um, having worked in the ACT Government Economic Development Directorate for a short time, uh, I understand that this city has such overwhelming intellectual oomph. It's got yeah. the smartest people in the world live in Canberra. Um, I've, I've met some of them, people that work in NASA, uh, etc, etc. We can export that to the world and we should be doing that. Um, so that's part of what uh, to progress this platform to do that. Thank you. We're going to take a question from the audience. This should be addressed to a specific candidate, and then we'll go back to general panel ones for the next one. Um, so, hands up. Uh, you, sir. Um, who wants to answer this question? The reason I'm asking the question is I believe we have a constitutional and an environmental crisis. So, the first part of the question is um, what do you think about the Does any candidate want that? And if you do, I'm going to knock you out for a future round. So, hands up to take that now. Tim? Yep. Um, so, the Greens have been working on consensus basis internally in the party since the party was founded. Um, we fundamentally believe that that's the way to go. Not, uh, and I guess the, the point about consensus, um, which a lot of people don't understand, but I'm sure that you do, sir, um, is that it, it depends on constructive conversation to get to outcomes where, at the end of it, everyone's satisfied with it. It might not be exactly what you want, but you're satisfied with it. I think at, a, at the level of national politics, um, what we need, I, I guess the term that I would use is not consensus, but deliberation, proper deliberation. What we so often get in our politics is, um, is just head-to-head -head fighting um, and the attempt for one party to win out over the other. Instead of groups working together, constructively to find solutions that, that actually meet the requirements of each party. And the reason I would s set that aside from consensus is because I think there's a lot of issues where certain members of the parliament aren't actually working for the same cause. So, for instance, the way Christine Milne worked with the Multi-Party Climate Change Committee was that the terms for coming to the table were that you believe that climate change is an issue. There's no point actually having a discussion towards climate policy with a group of people who don't care about climate change and don't want to do anything about it. What there is a point in is getting those who do care about the issue together and deliberating together, working together to get to good outcomes. And I'm a passionate believer in that. And I think that's a critical role that the Greens can play, is bringing people together around the table and saying, OK, we need, we need to get our heads together here, leave aside those who don't care about this issue, and those of us who do work together for constructive outcomes. Okay. We're going to go back to a question for all the candidates. Um, now, I've been reminded by Stephen that the rules are supposed to be that time is shared between the parties, so it's three minutes for uh, each of the blocks, and the independents get their three minutes. So, my apologies for the earlier mistake, and we're moving forward. So, hands up if you have a question. Uh, yes. Thank you. Um, my name is Diana. Um, my question is to do with multiculturalism. Um, I think that though I was born and raised here, I'm still very much connected to the multicultural community and if I were to look across the room here now, there's only really two people who represent the very diverse community that we have here in the ACT and Australia in general, Anthony and of course Nina, would know that sort of multicultural background. I'm concerned that a big chunk of our community is completely left out of the debate 
at so many levels. We don't even hear the word multicultural anymore, either at a federal level or even here in the ACT, it completely dropped the ball when it comes to multiculturalism. So your views on really ramping it up, because when you bring people from all around the world and you put them in a country like Australia and say, get on with each other, it doesn't work like that. There's a lot of work that needs to be done to bring in that harmony, social harmony together. What are your views in bringing back multiculturalism and bringing in strong policies that help bring us together so we don't have racism and people shooting people in a mosque? Somebody from Australia going and shooting somebody in a mosque because he didn't feel like he he was um, being represented even though he's from a majority. So how can we better bring in multiculturalism? Sure. Um, so I guess the first thing I'd say is I would caution you about um, stereotyping people on the basis of their appearance. And so you've made an assumption about my cultural background, which may or may not be accurate, but I'd just like to flag that as, as an assumption. And that's one of the things that often clouds this, this sort of debate. Um, there's a question around what multiculturalism means, um, is and what it actually means. From my own practical experience in the mid 90s, the Howard government decided that we didn't, we were going to be awash with unemployed doctors, and so they cut the number of medical school positions in half. And so I spent from about 2002 to about 2011 as the staff specialist on the floor in Calvary, um, melding together a workforce where, for um, any 20 hour hour shift of 15 medical staff, um, two of them had had their degree from Australia, um, three of them had had their degree from some other rugby playing nation, and the other sort of nine um, had come from a variety, but every possible um, different part on the planet where you can get a medical degree. The only place we've never employed is someone from Antarctica. And so I'm quite, you know, I'm familiar with what needs to happen to try and engender a sense of common purpose and respect, and that's what needs to happen. One needs to to have continued dialogue around what is it that our commonality is and what is it that, you know, and mutual respect around where our differences are and how can we then work together and live harmoniously. Um, so, you know, I, for, I often think people kind of get hung up about, you know, planes and how they fly along and there's like a flap and is it up or is it down? Do we need bigger government or smaller government? Um, maybe if we were in Scandinavia, I would argue that we needed smaller government. Maybe if we were in you know, Australia at the moment, I might argue perhaps we could use slightly bigger government. Um, what, what are our differences? What are our commonalities? What do, would, would, one, would one need to give up to live in this sort of society? So absolutely, that's a dialogue that needs to happen. And I would support continuing to do that. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> Uh, moving on. Uh, hey, uh, good question, by the way. Um, so I grew up, my parents came from overseas, and I grew up in uh, you know, Western Creek High School, pretty tough high school. I got caught wog a lot. I'd noticed um, racism's kind of changed a little bit nowadays. Wogs are okay, but it's these Middle Easterns or the ones with different coloured skin that seem to be the targets because the wogs are kind of more like the Anglo Saxons. It's an evolving thing. Um, and our perceptions change. And I had the pleasure of meeting Diana the other night. My first question was, where are you from? She said, I'm from Brisbane. <laughs> and uh, so, obviously, <laughs> exactly. And, uh, and we had a chuckle about it. And there was no offence at all there. And, uh, you know, we, we had a big chuckle and I talked about my experiences and you talked about yours. But um, I'm sure a lot of people would agree here that the Multicultural Festival in this city is even better than Summer Dance. <laughs> right? And I love cars. Um, it is our, I think it's the coolest thing we've got in Canberra, and that's, that's an example of when multiculturalism works. Um, but like our little conversation the other day, it's about understanding one another. Uh, you know, there's been talk recently about the secularity of schools, how chaplains shouldn't be in schools. You know, I'd argue it's, it's not a bad thing to have religion taught in schools, um, like history, for example. Um, it is part of what brought us to where we are today. You don't have to accept it, but it's good to understand it because it is important to some people, it's not to others, but it is a function of how we got to where we are. Um, and it's it's these sorts of, um, you know, forms of education about history, about, you know, religion, about everything that makes us all different. Food, everything that defines us as being a little bit different to the guy sitting next to me. Um, I think that's knowledge and, and acceptance is what is necessary here. So we, we need programs in schools Let's talk about this. Um, let's talk about why people look differently, why people dress differently. And if it starts from an early age onwards, 
uh, you know, I think that that's what will make this work even better. Uh, like I said, I, I grew up in a time when, you know, I felt it, uh, even though I was born and raised here. And, and I don't think I look that much different to my friends, but, you know, it might be because of the weird surname or whatever, they pick you. Um, I think things have changed, but, you know, they, they could change a lot, and I think it's really in education is the answer for it. I guess my wife's Mexican and um, <clears throat> my kids are half Mexican and we half speak Spanish at home. But I mean, that's not the real point, but basically I've worked as a migration lawyer for the last 15 years battling the Australian government and I've got a very particular perspective on the issue of um, multiculturalism and the purposes with which the government has been running the, um, the migration program. And I want to say first up though, like it's odd that um, the Liberal Party has run this anti-asylum anti seeker agenda for, for 15 years and it's been almost at the heart of their divisive debate in terms of Australian politics and it's won them elections and it's been a disgrace. It's been a disgrace because that issue is practically irresolvable and I don't have a position on how we can have a well-ordered migration program in Australia and allow skilled people to migrant, migrate and students and so forth and build a multicultural community but what do we do with these people that are escaping these awful war-torn countries? Like there is no solution really but one solution is don't lie about it and don't put it on the front page of the Daily Telegraph and don't run political campaigns on it for a generation because that is entirely damaging to the multicultural community in Australia. So, what I want to say, so we've, at, in the, my professional work, we've come out and started advocating on behalf of the multicultural community, and because we think there's a continuum between the way the Liberal Party has treated asylum seekers, and basically they've been really tough on asylum seekers, but at the same time they're flooding the country with temporary immigrants. So you might have noticed they cut the permanent immigration program from 190,000 to 160,000. But at the same time, there's more people here on bridging visas, there's more temporary residents in the country than ever before. So Sydney is going to be just as full, Melbourne's going to be just as full, full, but they won't be permanent residents, which means they don't have the same industrial rights, they don't have the same civil rights as other, other Australian people. And in fact, so there's this good cop, bad cop issue happening in the migration program. When it spins over to issues of multiculturalism and citizenship, the Australian government has the right to determine uh, the um, time that you need to stay in Australia before you can apply for citizenship. In fact, our citizenship laws are really generous and you have to be here for four years, including one year as a permanent resident. About a year ago, the Australian government wanted to change that and it wanted to extend the time that you needed to be here as a permanent resident. That's reasonable. I mean, they wanted to put it to four years. That's reasonable. But in fact, they made it retrospective. So it meant that there was a whole lot of people in the pipeline that then had their legitimate expectations damaged by the retrospective nature of that legislation. So as lawyers, we can't comment on the substantive policy. It's not my place to do that. But it is essentially unfair, and it was in that same continuum of abusing the multicultural community and attacking the multicultural community because they thought there was votes in it from the right. So honestly, it's time to speak sort of honestly about these issues. And I'd also like to get a response from um, someone who's, running, who's come into Australia um, from a country like Afghanistan and um, how you can be with time. the Liberal Party, mm -hmm. honestly. Yeah. Um, and just note, Diana, um, the assumption that was made. My parents both came here as refugees. Um, my father from Hungary, um, Hungarian Jewish family. My mother, Russian Jewish, out of China. When I decided to run for parliament, I investigated the potential for citizenship of seven different countries that I had a background in, found that I was a citizen of two and had to, um, had to renounce. So um, I do understand very, very much the issue. Um, the critical point that I would make before handing over to Penny to say some more um, is an area that the Greens have been very, very active in, is, um, is hauling back hate speech. Um, the, the critical thing that we need to do in this country to support a multicultural society is to not accept hate speech in the parliament, in the media, in our national discourse. We absolutely must prevent it. Choose. It's, it's one answer for each party. I thought it was three minutes for each party. Well, it's two minutes. I'll be super quick. No, you two minutes. Oh, so. okay. I won't be quick then. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I guess just following on from uh, what Tim said, you know, I think, you know, Nicholas laid out, you know, all of the kind of details around refugee policy and migration, but, you know, it's really sort of hard to understand again I suppose um, you know someone from a multicultural background running for the Liberal Party when you know a lot of the key problems do stem from the fact that they've 
got a lot of people locked up in offshore detention that they're torturing. Um, you know, this is also something that the Labour Party is on board with. And then just the general hate speech that is kind of normalised and supported in, you know, every day when the Liberal Party kind of opens their mouth to talk about something. So this is how we end up having um, events like happened in Christchurch when, uh, you know, it is really normalised and there's so much othering that goes on um, constantly from the Liberal Party and the National Party, uh, you know. And I, I teach at ANU and it's such a multicultural, diverse place. Um, and it it's really is, you know, it's so amazing and it just, it, it's so effective. And I, I went there from working in the parliament. It was such a stark contrast to what was, you know, my former boss termed as a, um, uh, a stale jar of mayonnaise because it was just full of these old white people. And we are really lacking in having um, diversity in terms of gender, race, religion, and everything else. Um, and it's something that, you know, the Greens are really committed to to working towards within our party, but also um, broadly within society and representation in Parliament. Yeah, uh, our city and our nation is much richer for having people from all around the world from a diversity of backgrounds, and we should celebrate that and support that and learn from each other and understand each other. Um, absolutely we should you know, call out racism or hate uh, whenever it happens and it always comes from a place of ignorance. And I think, as others have mentioned, I think that our response to that should be both uh, from the bottom up and the top down. Bottom up through education at the youngest age of uh, encouraging people to embrace and celebrate difference and understand one another and from the top absolutely uh, in our, from our politicians uh, and our media we need to stop lying and, and uh, you know, dog whistling politics particularly around refugees. Thanks so much. Can I have some extra time to answer this? Uh, I'm joking. Uh, That's fine. Um, all right, so firstly let me address the fact that um, Diana that's a very important question that you've brought up and um, I just want to address one one pet peeve that I have. You can be all for multiculturalism and people of migrant backgrounds and refugee backgrounds but don't you dare, don't you dare tell any migrant and any refugee person that's from that background to be what you want them to be. I have the rights and freedoms to choose whoever the hell I want to represent based on my principles, based on my values. So please don't think that just because I'm a migrant, you have the right to tell me who to represent and how to be. Don't box me up, you have no right. <laughs> Secondly, it's not your turn, it's not your turn. <laughs> Secondly, I agree, there has been a lot of dog whistling happening. There has been, that's, you know, we all know it. But what's the solution to that? What's the solution? And the solution to your multiculturalism question is the fact that we all need to come together and come from a place of respect and understanding. Now, the biggest thing that has disappeared from Australia since I grew up here as a child is that element of respect. So firstly, let's respect other people's views. Secondly, let's respect the fact that they have a right to choose however the hell they want to live their lives. Just like I respect yours, you should perhaps respect mine. Thirdly, I think that the responsibility is twofold. It not only befalls the people of, not of multicultural backgrounds, but those of multicultural backgrounds. And I think that, as I've said before, and I've said this publicly, we need to open our doors. Everybody needs to open our doors. Get to know your neighbor, have conversations, ask the questions, don't be scared to ask the question. I'm a Muslim, ask me whatever the hell you like. I won't be upset, I won't you know, have any issues with it. Now, when we go to a, a higher level of this in politics, multicultural communities need to be better represented in politics. There's no doubts about that. Here in Canberra, the, the Canberra Liberals are a very multicultural uh, bunch of people. And you all know this. There's Elizabeth Lee, there's Elizabeth Kickett, and I don't know what the backgrounds of the others are, but there are a few others in there as well. Even Zed, even Zed, for example. Now, unfortunately, I can't say that of the other parties here locally. At a federal level, 
it's pretty much on par both sides. So, you know, if you, you can't be what you can't see. And if we want to see more multicultural perspective uh, represented in Parliament, we need to vote that way. Okay, so we're going back to the audience. The question now is for us to Sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Three minutes between you. All right, yeah. um, Thanks, Mia. That was a, a really great response, um, especially from you know, your side of the political divide. And I do a lot of thinking about this particular issue. Having been in the army, I've seen people from all over the country, all different nationalities and faiths. Um, I've commanded these people overseas. <clears throat> um, the thing that, that comes down to me is, uh, sorry, what it comes down to me for, uh, is um, when you look at people like the Fraser Annings of the world, why Why are they like that? Why have they got such fear of the other? What, what is it? Um, it's all about your identity um, and the fear of the other. And the fear is basically, it's based on misunderstanding, not um, having that, that dialogue, that education, that awareness of who those others are. Um, having been around the world, you know, people are people are people. They all love their kids. They all want to just get ahead, um, have a comfortable and safe life. So we all start from that base level of value. That's where we should be starting. Um, the, the problem is for these people who, who come from a less educated background, who don't have exposure to, to um, the other, as, as we label it, um, is, is that they don't have that dialogue. They don't have that understanding. They don't know who these people are. They just see what's presented to them in a some more biased media, and, so, and these are generally people who stick to one source of media, one source of communication. They form an opinion. Um, it's, it's that narrative which informs who they are as a person, which uh, um, results in behaviour. Um, this is exactly what happened with his fellow in New Zealand. He was, his narrative was all 8chan, and, his, and that little group of people forms this identity, his understanding of the world around him, and he acts on it. What we need to do is break those things apart and it's like these, a lot of people have talked about here it's it's, it's starting at the early stage um, and also here and now in, in with adults making sure that people understand that people are people right? um, one of the phenomenon I, I always like to go back and have a look at is that the, um, the feeling of uh, distrust towards a certain ethnic or religious group in the community is always highest in the neighbourhoods that are immediately around it, as opposed to actually in the neighbourhood. It's because those people in the neighbourhood speak and interact with others every day. So it's 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 a, it's a clear um, it's a clear line that we need to we need to identify and break down. And that's that's something that us as leaders need to be standing up in the houses of parliament and saying, Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand has been exemplary. But this is the kind of leadership that we need in this country. People that say they are us. That's what we need. Um, okay. The well, Respect, understanding, leadership. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, folks. Uh, this is a question for a specific candidate. Um, who's got one? Uh, gentleman in the green shirt over there. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my question is for Mina. So imagine you had been elected to the current federal parliament in the last election, and you were in the party room during the most recent leadership spill. Who would you put your support behind? Turnbull, uh, Morrison, or Dutton, and why? Uh, three minutes, please. Well, Morrison wasn't actually in the running. It was Peter what? Dutton and Malcolm Turnbull. Um, but let me start with the fact that I was against the, the spill. I didn't think that it should have happened because it was, I mean, none of us wanted it. Whether you vote liberal or not, nobody wanted it. Um, and so it is unfortunate that it happened, but I do completely back Scott Morrison as our Prime Minister. I think he's a great PM and I think he will uh, lead us to success in the next election. So I hope that answers your question. Is there a bit more why? Policy? Sorry? What is the why? On the why. Why? Why? Because um, I do believe that Scott Morrison is a genuine person who represents. Um, well, you can laugh all you like, but he is. He is, and I've met him, so I can tell you. Um, whereas none of you have. Um, so, sure, you can make assumptions all you like, but you know, from someone from someone who has actually met him, I can tell you that he's a very genuine person. 
And what you see is what you get with Scott Morrison. He's a very open and upfront person. It's why he makes you know a few silly gaps sometimes. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Okay, we're going back to the audience. We're after a question for the whole panel. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, right. So um, what I've observed and what I've read from Thomas Piketty's Capital in the 21st Century is that we're seeing a, a massive return to um, a kind of like uh, autocracy, uh, a return to the days of Jane Austen, where we're seeing a return to massive uh, wealth inequality. Given, hopefully, the understanding that people understand the diminishing utility of money, the more you have, the, mess you're, the less you're likely to value it, and the fact that we should actually consider giving people enough money to have uh, autonomy, and uh, much like Mina said, I think this is a value we all share, that everyone actually has the ability to for self-determination and so forth. Given that, what are the various parties going to do about the fact that wealth inequality will keep going unless we do something dramatic to our system because wealth from capital outweighs massively uh, earnings from uh, jobs and regular work almost to the point well basically his conclusion was to the point that we do not have okay. Okay. quickly this question uh, so how, how are you going to address massive wealth inequality three minutes huh? uh, look it's a pertinent question globally yes you're completely right there is a smaller and smaller amount of wealth, sorry, a larger and larger amount of wealth falling into a smaller and smaller amount of uh, hands. Um, globally, Australia is not doing too badly. We're one of the better countries out there. Um, does that mean we can just ignore this? No, it doesn't. Um, but there's something to be said about the structures that we have in, if I were to call it, Western democracies. Um, this can be a very subjective issue, so we'll try and get some objectivity on it. And I'd argue that if we look at the way immigration flows happen globally, they tend to gravitate towards countries like Australia. Um, so I'm not saying we're perfect, but I'm saying that it's an issue that we've got down a lot better than pretty much 95, if not more, percent of the rest of the world. Um, we've got pretty good laws in terms of minimum wages. Can they be better? Can a, can a minimum wage be increased? Uh, you know, these are all questions that we, we try to get answers to. Um, ultimately, we need a strong economy for any of this to be feasible. Um, and I'm not saying that that's a priority, but without it, all of this can just be rhetoric. Uh, so ultimately, if we have a strong economy, these things can actually be achieved. And so far, globally, I think that Australia is doing not that badly in this regard. Maybe the questioner should come up here as a candidate himself. He seems to have a good set of ideas. But no, basically, from the, our perspective, the perspective of the Democratic Reform Alliance, it, it's basically the wealthy countries are also the democratic countries and the countries with least inequality. So basically, it comes down to a political question. And corruption goes hand in hand with inequality. So if you have a look at our system, then the more that we can reform it to make it transparent, then you would assume the more uh, the, the equitable policies that we will have. So it, from our perspective, we don't have a policy on how to deal with these macroeconomic questions. But what we do want to do is to ban donations from corporations and, and from unions. So that if you want to donate, shareholders can donate, union members can donate, but we've got to get rid of this corporate and branded money from politics. Okay. Another thing that we want to do is camp, strict campaign funding rules, because you can't have you know, $10 million being donated by a, by a mining company to run a particular campaign in Western Australia at a state government election. We have to do something about that. We also need to do something about the politicians' entitlements and the abuses that are occurring on a, you know, fairly, on a weekly basis by these um, various, various politicians of both major parties. Um, freedom of information. Um, whistleblower protections. We need to regulate lobbyists. It can't be that you can be voting on legislation one week and then um, going off into a big, highly paid lobbying job for that company that is, is, has an interest in the legislation you just voted on. Yeah. Yet you can under the system. I mean, it is crazy the amount of um, contradictions and conflicts of interest at all levels of our political system. And we will never be able to get up in equitable um, politics if we can't confront this issue. And it's a very narrow issue of um, integrity 
and also transparency and anti-corruption within our system. So from our, the perspective of our party, we don't have a broad vision of what and how this should all work after the system's been cleaned up, but we know that, it, we, that, we know that the system has to be cleaned up before we can get any of this into, me, into discussion, meaningful discussion. So it's our, our vision is limited, but fundamental. And, and I'm also seeking to um, look to work with the independents and, and the minor parties. And the Greens were fantastic on these issues of um, um, transparency. And we need to work together to put it to the major parties and to, to, to work out how we can demand some of these changes that will then allow the full flourishing of our democracy. Economic inequality is a massive and growing problem here in Australia and globally as well. And technology is really driving that kind of rapid increase that we're seeing at the moment as well. The Greens have very strong policies around um, taxing the very wealthy and also large corporations. We want them to pay, the, pay their fair shares so that we can fund the social services that we need and also increase um, New Start and youth allowance by $75 a week. We also have longer term plans and not policies at this election um, around universal basic income. Um, but you know we want a Buffett rule to make sure that the very wealthy people who are earning over three hundred thousand dollars a year have a, a lower threshold of tax that they can't reduce their tax below. We want to make sure that large corporations are actually paying tax. We want to make sure that um, you know people who are taking out natural resources are actually paying for them at the moment. You know, they're able to get those for free, and those are kind of our key policies that we want to make sure. The tax system is fair, we can reduce inequality and make sure that everyone has what they need to be able to live their lives. Yeah, Betty's covered um, pretty much everything I was going to say, obviously, same party. Um, so the, the fundamental point is that the huge inequality in Australian society is that um, we allow a third of the largest corporations operating in Australia today to pay no tax at all and then we cry poor and we say we can't afford to fund health and education and welfare reform. We need to tax those um, companies properly. Um, we need to ban corporate donations and set up a national ICAC. Um, we need to remove the tax breaks on, on super and housing and that kind of thing um, and lift a new start. Um, industrial relations reform is absolutely critical to that as well and we would be very keen to work with the Labor Party on getting good strong industrial relations reform so that those so that companies actually pay their um, the, the fair wages um, to their employees. And yeah, I think one of the most exciting areas is this idea of universal basic income, which I've written on extensively. Um, the idea that if we do actually get um, government funding through proper, um, proper taxation of those who can afford it, then everybody could get a living wage um, to choose their own way forward. And I think that's one of the most exciting ideas that's out there at the moment um, in the global world of policy. Great question, thank you. Um, Labor have been talking for a long time about addressing the growing inequality in Australia and um, we've been talking about inclusive growth. And I was really um, pleased when I was working in the opposition policy team to work with Jenny Macklin on her uh, Growing Together, which is a very detailed and long blueprint about um, Labor's plan to deliver inclusive growth and address inequality. But I think in a three minute time frame, bring it down to two main things that we need to do. Uh, which is uh, decent wages and social investment. And you can see that Labor has always been a defender of both these things and is doing that very starkly uh, at the moment um, in contrast to uh, the Coalition. So we're talking about a living wage and it begins with changing the rules so that people can uh, bargain for decent wages. And that's been you know, a foundation of what has made Australia a relatively egalitarian society for many years is that back to federation we had uh, wage arbitration. Secondly is social investment and it is about our social security system being adequate but it's also brought more broadly it's about investing in health and education and all those things that foster a society where everyone has the best chance to, um, to you know, be healthy and well uh, and uh, do the things that they want to do. Um, really great question and really great answers. Now, it's one thing to write about poverty and uh, read about poverty and perhaps uh, write policy about poverty and it's something completely different to live poverty. I've lived it. I've lived it. 
My mum was on a new start allowance. She's now very well off. She's very comfortable in shore. She's not a millionaire, but she's comfortable in the way she lives. And the reason for that is that she had the opportunity to get herself out of poverty. And that opportunity only comes through economic strength and the opportunity to work and for more jobs. There's no other way forward. We can talk about increasing New Start, increasing welfare and all of that, but there's just no point. If people are going to be stuck in that cycle of poverty forever and all we're doing is aiding and abetting that cycle of poverty, there's no point in increasing any of it. What we need to do is provide people with the opportunities to lift themselves out and give them a helping hand, like through the New Start allowance. Now, in Australia, we are the second, I think, the second uh, wealthiest in the OECD world. And so, you know, we're pretty well off. Go and compare us to another country somewhere else and, uh, yeah, we can pat ourselves on the back. And that comes from the fact that we need to provide people with more opportunity, not welfare, opportunity. Okay, thanks. Uh, I've worked in uh, aid and international development for about 25 years, so I can see some of those um, um, social problems that creep into countries where there is increasing uh, economic inequality. In Australia, we can see increasing economic inequality is starting to look like um, a two-tier system for the, the haves and the have-nots in terms of access to privileged education, access to health, uh, where the have-nots don't have that. So in a progressive society, we see that having um, reduced economic inequality is a very, very fine thing, and we are not afraid of the T word, which is taxation. So a progressive taxation uh, regime, similar to what some of our, our contemporaries here have talked about, uh, there, there are those that can afford to pay more tax and we think taxing the, the wealthy, the companies, is a, is a way to bring a much better uh, revenue base uh, into Australian government through which we can uh, increase things like age pensions, new start allowance, etc. Uh, massive investment in public education and public health is also our platform in terms of reducing that economic inequality and uh, reducing what we see as a progressively um, social uh, inequality as well and social isolation. Thanks Teresa, I'll just expand on that. Um, yeah, we're looking at a, um, we would like to reform taxation so that it is more progressive, not only for individuals but businesses as well. It's um, strange to me that we have a flat tax which is a, in by nature a regressive tax for, for companies. We're looking at things um, of like raising the tax for free threshold which is a real you know it's an actual money in your pocket kind of kind of uh, thing to do um, uh, increase the number of brackets up to a higher level so you know we're getting the wealthy to actually pay their taxes um, clamping down on corporations uh, avoiding taxes and parking profits offshore that's well within what we're, we're trying to achieve um, so I think we have some allies on the, uh, the panel that in that regard. Uh, and some of the other things we'd like to look at are things like abolishing state payroll tax. Obviously, it's not something we can achieve from a federal um, platform. But um, attempts to democratise the economy, put money back into local ownership, as opposed to the, the current model, model we have, which is more and more uh, a monopolisation of, of markets by big players in the space. People, um, corporations who own a bunch of companies that extract wealth mm. out of communities put them in the shareholders' pockets. We want to um, break that system down so that we have more small business owners. This goes into Nina's point about more opportunities. So small business being the backbone of the economy, put that money back into the uh, into local communities and let them flourish, uh, pull their own, put themselves up by the bootstraps, for want of a better term. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so I'm not an economist. <laughs> um, my limited understanding would support your concern, you know, neoliberal economics and the idea that it all trickled down seems to have not worked in any, you know, we, we after 30 years of trialling that model across a number of different sort of countries with that sort of regulation, um, you've got uh, the economy getting bigger, so it's been good for good increasing GDP, um, you've got the 
of the population are wholly controlling the alternative thing. So there's that gap there. I, it seems to me that that is an issue. Um, my understanding is that Mina's correct, Australia is um, the second wealthiest country per capita in the OECD. Um, I am curious about the distribution of that wealth per capita and in terms of what we should do about it, my belief is that the constituency that I seek to represent have consistently stated that they would be happy to pay more tax for more reliable education and health services and I would strongly endorse that. Um, and, you know, both sides of parliament, of politics of both the major parties have had the opportunity to do that. Wayne Swan, Swan had the opportunity to rewrite the, you know, the whole, we can't afford it, but then we'll give you a tax cut thing. Um, Wayne Swan has had a, had a couple of opportunities to rewrite that national narrative, um, probably in his second and third budget, and, and didn't take that opportunity to do so. So I would advocate for those positions, but I would be certainly needing, in terms of the actual detail about how one would achieve it and where you would set it and whether payroll tax is the way to go, no idea, mate. <laughs> okay, so I'm looking for questions from the audience, and it needs to be addressed to a specific candidate. And I believe Tim and Mina have had specific questions, so they're out. Uh, hands up if you've got a question. Uh, yes, the lady in the back there. Hi, I've got a question for Alicia Payne. Um, so, as we know, the ACT is one of the most progressive states in the country. Can we be one of the most progressive again? So my question to you is about Labor's position on refugees. Yeah. Um, we know Labor backed the Medibank bill, which basically has done nothing, not their fault for that. Um, but would you and would you push the Labor Party to actually bring those refugees offshore here and try to commit to a more humane policy in the future? Uh, thank you for your question. Um, look. <coughs> It's really important to me that Australia treats anyone in our care humanely. Asylum seekers are exercising their right and Australia should be uh, in accordance with the, our international obligations to uphold that. They have done nothing wrong. Uh, they shouldn't be treated, you know, they shouldn't be in appalling conditions uh, for unlimited amounts of time. Um, refugees was the first thing that I became politically active about um, back when I was at uni um, and I was uh, in the Refugee Action Collective and the issue at the time was about the detention centres being privately owned and when I look now at the way things have deteriorated, uh, you know, those issues back then while bad, we have a lot more to worry about now. I will say that in our pre-selection uh, for ACT Labor was one of the key issues and I know that it's a key issue for Canberra. It is a very progressive place and I'm so proud of that and I'd be so proud to represent that in our caucus and in our parliament. Okay, folks, we're going to do our very last question. This for the whole panel. Uh, so hands up if you've got that. Um, sir in the rainbow jacket. Thank you. Hi. Chris Richards, freelance journalist representing Independent Australia today. Um, I'll try not to make this too lengthy, but I want to give you enough information to be able to answer. So, recently a migrant family whose child has been diagnosed as deaf, and just this week another family whose child has just been diagnosed with autism. Both families have lived in Australia as migrants for the past five years. They're core members of their local community. They work, they contribute to Australian society. But they have now been refused their permanent residency visas because of the children's medical conditions and have been told that they are both facing deportation within months, the entire family. I would like to ask you, what do you think of the medical requirements policy when it comes to permanent residency visas? And is it time that we urgently review this policy? And I'll just add, I myself have autism. I don't see myself as a burden on the Australian taxpayer and thankfully the government isn't trying to ship me out of the country because of my recent diagnosis. I would like to know why we, be, we would treat migrant families any different just because they aren't born here when they're contributing to society the same way as I am. Well, I mean, that's a very good and problematic question. And the reason for that health policy is that when people get permanent residency, they get access to Medicare. Okay, so the thing is, the question is, who should be entitled to apply for permanent residence and what, what, and what other legal requirements? And one of the legal requirements is that you're basically well. Another is that you don't have um, criminal convictions and there's a whole lot of other things. You need to be a certain age, have good English, have qualifications to be able to migrate. 
So when they do the health policy assessment, they look at whether the cost, they look at two things, and basically it's the cost to the community, and they put a figure on it of about $40,000. And there's a very detailed policy guide on a whole lot of different illnesses, not just autism and not just deafness, but a whole lot of other different heart conditions and cancer, AIDS. It doesn't mean that if you've got AIDS, you can't migrate, but basically they'll look at, the, at, at whether the cost to the community, and the other thing they look at is access to services. Because some, in some areas, if you need a new kidney, there's not that many new kidneys floating around. So if we grant a visa to someone coming in from outside Australia and they need a kidney, it means an Australian won't get a kidney. So it's one of these areas of, of migration policy that are very difficult, and there's going to be no easy answers to that question, basically. But that's the reason for the, 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 the policy for, the, for that um, child having his visa refused. Um, it's now the Minister has a discretion to make a, a personal decision to allow that family to stay or not. And I was actually working with United Voice, um, has been working to campaign with that particular family, and I've been speaking to United Voice on that issue um, because it has gone public. But I mean, it, it is now with the Minister and he's got a discretion to, to wave that family through. But the question is how many families can be waved through before there's you know, a, a real cost to the Australian health system? So again, with so many of these migration matters, there's no easy answers. And I, in fact, agree with John Howard, which is quite strange, but Australia has the um, right to determine who comes to Australia and the conditions under which they come. Because otherwise we can't have a proper migration program. And the amount of suffering and the need in the world is such that they can't all come. But within that, I think we can treat people more fairly and I think we can articulate reasons why in the migration program things like this are happening with that family who are having their visa refused. And I think that we can also get back to that question of multiculturalism be a little bit more respectful for people who have arrived and we can stop the politicking on um, the uh, other uh, issues because it is very political migration and it's, and it's a tough jurisdiction to work in as well, let me say. And I've done it for 15 years, battling the department every day on behalf of our clients who are, have all kinds of, kind of fairly awkward or difficult circumstances. But the fact is that's why we need a Department of Immigration that is properly funded, that's not privatised, full of trained officers that are making legal decisions. But apart from that, you know, um, you know well, that's why, um, you know, I mean, there's, there's not easy solutions there. I, I, so that's, that's my view as a migration professional that have worked in it for 15 years. Um, not easy. But we've got to do it compassionately and, and, and in accordance with the law, basically. Thanks for the question. Look, I think it's you know I think it's absolutely disgusting that these um, children are looking at being um, deported, uh, and I know the Greens have come out very strongly against it, uh, particularly Senator Jordan Steele John, who is our disability rights spokesperson. Um, I mean, I think it just goes to showing an absolute lack of compassion um, for these these people as human beings um, who have been living in Australia, who consider themselves to be Australians. Um, and you know, I think we do need a review. I do think it, it is, you know, would be a complex issue to consider, but there's just, you know, absolute lack of compassion. And the the minister, you know, feels free to grant certain exceptions for people that, you know, aren't in so much need. And I think it's, I think it's not right to cherry pick um, immigrants based on how much we think that they're going to, you know, contribute to our economy. We also need to have a holistic view of. Um, you know, them as human beings and um, have a compassionate role in that as well. Um, previously about inequality um, and what we can do in this country. Um, if we do actually um, tax corporations properly and remove so many of the tax concessions, um, a recent figure that uh, Michael West, a uh, journalist, brought forward was over $300 billion a year through simply fixing a number of tax corporate tax loopholes. If we did that kind of thing, then we could move this whole conversation away from the question of um, burden on the economy or otherwise and consider everybody as human beings and not as currently Australian and potentially Australian or not Australian at all. Um, we have the capacity and the responsibility as a wealthy country, as a, as a modern country, um, and as a compassionate country to support people from all around the region. Um, and you know, that's before you even consider the question of whether it's reasonable to say that um, a deaf child or a, or a child with autism would be a burden. Um, we should take it completely out of that context if we actually um, had the, the, the courage 
of leadership in the country to tax those who can afford it properly so that we could support our whole community and the broader community. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for your question, Chris. I was so saddened to see that example. Um, and I know that people in my electorate who were just friends of theirs, um, of that family actually got in touch with me and were trying to see if there's anything I could do to help because it was obvious they had, you know, such a, a role in the community and, you know, it just, it just seemed completely heartless and also ridiculous that you've got a family, you know, co contributing and um, being a part of a community that would just have their lives ripped apart like that. And I can only hope that, uh, you know, compassion and common sense will prevail in this particular instance. But Yes, I think it should be reviewed. I think it says a lot about how we view disability in our community. It says something about how we uh, value people that we've, you know, have come here and willing to deport them because of something like that. I, yes, I absolutely think it should be reviewed. That's a great question, and I have a friend who has an autistic son, so I know I know the struggles. And um, with regards to the two families that you refer to, one of them. Uh, like Alicia said, a member of the electorate has contacted me to see what I can do and it's all good and well to talk about you know, tax reform and all these fanciful ideas of how we can help these families but what have you actually done to help these families? I'll tell you what I've done. I've actually lobbied for them with the Department of Immigration and got Senator Zed Sazelger on board as well who was also lobbying for them. So if you want action, that's action. Uh, the Australian progressives are guided by a number of principles, three of which are uh, empathy, e equality and evidence. So uh, we think there does need to be an empathetic look at the, the case that you describe. But the other, the other interesting one, and following up with something Alicia said, is the evidence about uh, disability um, and um, conditions such as autism. I have a brother who's diagnosed as autistic. Um, and um, we had actually, the progressives had a candidate who ran in a previous uh, state of uh, state election, oh, sorry, by election, who was hearing impaired. Uh, both of these individuals contribute a lot more to Australian society than than the so-called cost uh, cost to Australia. So um, we would absolutely see some benefit in um, in. Uh, reviewing the, the policy, uh, acknowledging that a blanket one size fits all does not fit all and, and that we would also make those decisions uh, through the lens of empathy. I don't think I have anything much to add. I would echo the sentiments that I think everyone has expressed. Um, I agree um, with, you can have a diagnostic label which may or may, which bears no resemblance whatever to one's capacity to engage in a member of society or not. And so, you know, if you're going to make an a cost-benefit analysis, then it needs to be about functionalist, the functional engagement, not about that. So that would be a, an area of policy to review. And then there would then be a question around, more broadly, what sort of society do we want to live in? And do we want to be a society where um, everybody's net worth is based on their cost-benefit analysis, in which case, really, at the age of 85, um, when you're sort of a bit on your hopper frame, you just need to be chopped off um, in a sort of, what was that movie, Blake 7? Logan's Run. Logan's Run, Logan's Run. And you turned 21, didn't you? So it'd be, you turn 85, if you, you know, can you get to the other side of that room in, so, you know, if that's the sort of society that we want to live in, then perhaps that's where we need to go, and if we don't, perhaps we can have a look at the other opinions. Thanks for your question. I'll answer it in two parts. Um, firstly, when we look at policy towards immigration and refugees, uh, there are many factors that need to be taken into account that uh, ultimately lead to a policy that's sustainable. So having an open arms policy and letting anybody in for any reason wouldn't work. And so we work towards looking at who's coming, why they're coming, the reasons, you know, and, what, and also what they offer. And it can work in terms of if we have a shortage of doctors in Australia and all of a sudden we have a whole bunch of people who want to immigrate here with medicine degrees, that can really contribute to our society. Um, so some sort of policy towards uh, making immigration and intakes of refugees uh, is needed to make it sustainable. And I think that we all agree on that generally. Policies we might, you know, we can have, we can talk about for forever and a day. 
Um, now, having said that, the second part of my question is re regarding criteria. Uh, I think uh, medical conditions uh, shouldn't be a factor whatsoever. I think it's quite discriminatory to consider one's medical condition when we're considering their intake, whether they be a refugee or uh, or a permanent uh, immigrant to Australia, just like the colour of their skin or just like their race or just like their religion. I think the medical condition is would be a discriminating factor to consider in this regard, and I'd throw it out altogether. All right, folks, we have 15 minutes to go. Um, so I think at this point I'd like to throw it over to the candidates. Um, and we'll start with uh, Penny as the next Campbell of Lorraine. Um, just give us two minutes of um, why we should vote for you. And uh, let's roll. Okay. Thanks. Um, so I suppose, you know, as I said earlier, um, I'm, I want to represent the, the progressive values of Canberrans. I want to actually listen to Canberrans and I want to support them in the things that are important to them. Um, currently, uh, we have two senators in our parliament, one who um, I'm in competition with for the seat of the second seat, which is the Liberal Senator Zedza Selja. Um, I'm the best option to knock him out because we're the closest in terms of uh, votes. I mean, knock him out of the parliament, no. <laughs> um, we're we're pacifists. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, we know that he's let us down uh, time and time again in terms of um, not supporting the wishes of the electorate, not following through on things that he said he would support us on. You know, uh, we're a very progressive bunch. We want um, to see our rights realised as um, participants in our democracy and we're not seeing that at the moment. So, um, you know, things that are really important to us and that we've been talking to our community about, um, everybody that we've talked to in Canberra so far, one of the first things on their lips is action on climate change and the, the Greens are the ones that are going to deliver that. Um, you know, uh, the Labor Party's made some gestures in the right direction, but we really need as many Greens in the Parliament as possible to make sure that they follow through, but to pull them in the right direction and make sure that the policies go far enough. And particularly in terms of um, transitioning away from coal, uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, you know, it's come up a lot tonight. We know that Canberrans care about um, uh, humane treatment of asylum seekers. We want to close those camps. We want to bring those people here and we want to um, make them part of our society and we want to, you know, they are us. As um, has been mentioned, Jacinta Ardern's had a, you know, very inspiring sense on that. I'm, I think I'm probably out of time, but... <laughs> Thank you. So... Canberra is one of the most progressive places in the country um, and we really have an extraordinary opportunity with this brand new seat um, to elect um, a progressive um, who will be listening to the Canberra community and working with the Canberra community and making sure that the Canberra community gets heard. It's been said a few times tonight that um, when, when a city like Canberra is represented entirely by the major parties, it can get taken for granted. Um, and the Greens are the party that could um, win this central seat of Canberra and really make sure that Canberra is heard and listened to. Um, so that includes very, very much um, working constructively with presumably an incoming Labor government to get the strongest possible action on climate change and um, to acknowledge that they're better than the alternative, much better than the alternative, but not in line with the science. And we need to take that further. Um, to return briefly to that other issue of, of the... Um, of the cultural institutions, um, which so many people around Canberra care about so much, they absolutely won't get the support they need if Canberra continues to just be taken for granted by the major parties. So um, as a, as a long-term climate change activist, as somebody who's passionate about participatory democracy and being involved in building community conversations around all sorts of in, um, connection with politics and political decision making, um, I can be um, a passionate um, and, and strong representative for the Canberra community um, who can ensure that this city uh, gets the representation that it truly needs and deserves. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so um, I'm very proud to be Labor and I would say that Labor as a major party is not taking anything for granted about Canberra, um, not just in the sense of 
uh, you know, margins and things like that, those are irrelevant to the task at hand as a candidate and as a member. It's to get out and listen and talk to as many people as possible. And I've been doing that, as have my fellow candidates. Uh, I've grown up in Canberra, I love our city and I'm proud of our city and I'm progressive and I want to represent that progressive community in our caucus and in our parliament. And if elected, I'd be part of a team, hopefully forming a government that can actually deliver the action we need on all the things that we're talking about on climate change, on investing in the things that make our community fair, in delivering a living wage um, and rights to uh, bargain for fair wages in our community, to stand up for the vulnerable and stop the demonisation of, of you know, the poor in our communities, investing in things like housing, investing in our schools and investing in health. So that's why I should like to Who are we kidding? Most of you won't vote for me. <laughs> <laughs> that said, here's why you should consider it. Like I said at the beginning, I am a strong voice. I'm an advocate. I don't have a background in policy making. I'm not an economist. I'm not a climate change expert. None of those things. I'm an advocate. And I'm an advocate because I've lived it. And I'm a strong voice. Now, I said at the very beginning that Canberra needs respect. That is what I intend on bringing to Canberra. If I am elected, that is exactly what I will be working for. And now the beauty of me being a Liberal is the fact that I can cross the floor in support of what my constituents want. The other parties can't. That's all. So the reason you should vote for a progressive? Yes. Basically, well, the reason I'm a progressive and not a part of a major party is because, like it or not, major parties become beholden to their own vested interests and they, they have that through their political donors or their, their factions inside their own parties. Now, look, I've got great respect for every person on this panel, but once they're inside that, pa that party apparatus, they become somebody different. Our, our elected officials should be leaders. They should be setting a vision. They should be having a plan to move forward. Um, and if you're beholden to a set of vested interests, when are you going to have that vision? You, you, you can't put that forward. You're going to get disendorsed. The Australian Progressives are a party who are entirely funded by our members. We reject um, business, corporation, and organisational donations, which means, you know, although we support unions, we don't get, we won't take money from them. So. When you elect us, you actually get a person who's representative of you, not a vested interest. Remember that at the ballot box. We are there for you, not a narrow vested interest. Uh, so why vote for me as a member of the Australian Progressives? Um, voting in a minor party into parliament means that you do have to um, get legislation through the parliament with consensus and compromise and we think that brings a healthy democracy um, um, a democratic process why well, vote for me as Therese Faulkner an individual um, as mentioned before I grew up in Canberra from the age of four I lived in government housing rented in, in Belconnen. I've raised my children here. I've worked in the public service for 30 years. I've worked in the private sector for five years. I have uh, family members who cover a range of social circumstances from disability pensions to aged pensions to running small businesses, working in family businesses, working in the public service. So I think I've got um, quite a, a, a good um, bird's eye view across across uh, the social situation in a, in a city like Canberra. I think I can legitimately uh, be a voice and a good representative of the constituents of Bean, which is the, the seat for which I'm contesting. I'm also contesting Bean. Um, <laughs> so my goal then would be to differentiate myself from Therese. Um, <laughs> I agree with much of the sentiments around the need for representation that's a community voice, um, not beholden to sort of party factional members and internal power structures. Um, I am standing as an independent. Um, I am funded entirely by myself. I have, uh, the marketing man keeps wanting to put the donations page up. I've wanted to take it down, um, which may be where your mouth is. And I am standing because while I 
support many of the concerns that have been raised. If we not if we do not decarbonise the economy, then you know they they will become less relevant. Or you know, and our society is not going to maintain a degree of harmony. It's going to be increasingly difficult to maintain a sort of harmonious and comfortable society. It may already be too late, but if we don't start, so I will a voice for the community. But we need to decarbonise the economy. So I should vote for that. Uh, firstly, I used to be a Liberal voter, and I'm pretty pissed off with the hard right faction within the Liberal Party that has dragged it out of a centred right demographic, which is where it belongs. Corey Bernardi, and hear me out on this one, he did the right thing. He left the party to found a Conservative Party, and he's sanctioned off where he's not contaminating the rest of us. Uh, the Liberal Party, <laughs> we still have the hard right dinosaurs within the party that have ruined it. Zed is the local face of it, and the one thing that I've noticed with all of my campaigning and is an overwhelming response when people realise that I'm an option to replace Zed. Now, we're a democracy, and there are people with all sorts of different opinions in this room. Some can be left, some can be right, some can be up and down. Um, parliament, the word comes from the word parlay, which is to discuss, and what we need is a parliament which has different opinions, uh, and as long as they're respectfully debated, this is how we make progress with governance. Now, what I'm doing is presenting myself as a centre-right candidate and I'm bringing to the table, this is my second reason, I'm bringing to the table uh, renewables credentials. I've got a practical approach to this. I've worked in this field for, well, invested in this field for 15 years. Now, the Greens have blown every opportunity in the past, I don't know how they do in the future, but they've certainly blown every opportunity in the past to help influence energy policy, which helps the climate. Bob Brown blocked a carbon price, a carbon pollution reduction scheme in 2009 twice. That was the best thing that we had at the time, and even two Liberal Party members were ready to cross the floor on that issue. Um, and they paved the way for Abbott to come in and basically give us a, a, a climate change policy vacuum for years to come. Uh, finally, as an independent, I can represent the voters that, uh, that vote for me here in Canberra. I'm not part of a party. So I only have one accountability, and that's to Canberrans. Last person. Why you should vote for me is for strategic reasons, and that is basically we put the proposition forward that until we've dealt with the issue of corruption in the system, we're never going to get any of these progressive politics through. And that's just the reality of it. The other reason, the Democratic Reform Alliance, we've actually got an internally democratic structure and it, it'll be a structure that allows party members to vote to bind politicians, our politicians in the parliament once they're elected, qualitatively different from the way democracy is done within the other parties and something that, talking about a democracy, you can't have parties that are not democratic. So there's a big vision that we've got and a strategic vision as well. And the strategic vision is to combine with the minor parties to put it to the government if we are to be elected a position that we, in exchange for legislating the entire transparency agenda, we will provide support on confidence and the budget if they get that through in 100 days. So we're prepared to take that to the election, that negotiating position. We're not fairies at the bottom of the garden. We're not going to turn up in Parliament, thanks to your votes, without an agenda. And that agenda will be to push and shove and negotiate and blackmail the government if you like all that negotiation to get this agenda through as quickly as we can and once that is through then all of these other visions that these people have spoken about will be able to be realised but until we get to that point you know we can talk about these issues greenhouse and so forth till we're black in the face we can't do anything and this is the strategic value of the democratic reform alliance why you should consider voting for me in the senate and for stephen bailey in the seat of fenner is the vision that we've got it's democratic it's open we're calling for more participation by people by Australian people on a whole lot of different levels, including within the internal structure of our party. So I'd like, I would like you to refer you to the website and to get you thinking about these issues yeah. strategically and put your tick on the, on, the, on the ballot for me in the Senate. Nicholas Houston, thanks. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being involved in what I hope has been a uh, valuable piece of participatory democracy. Um, I think we should once again give a round of applause for all of our uh, candidates. Thank you. And now Stephen has a few words he wants to say. And um, have a great night, folks. Yeah. Thank you, John. Thank you, John.
yeah, just a, a quick thank you to John and a quick sincere thank you to all of the candidates who participated and a thank you to you, your supporting democracy in the ACT. I also have to make one retraction um, that there is some uh, a little bit more media here than I thought. Um, so I'll, t I'll take that back as well. But, <laughs> um, but, but still not enough. Look, uh, one of these people on the stage will be elected to Parliament, at least one. Um, we need the media in the ACT to start not supporting candidates, but, uh, but reporting on politics, new, new parties, independents, um, new candidates. Now, and, yeah, and, and that's for the Liberals as well. And, and I, I wasn't sincerely... mentioned in the last three articles by the Canberra Times. Yeah. But you were on Wings. And I sincerely <laughs> thank you for coming, Nina. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Stephen. Um, but the future of the 21st century depends on our politicians becoming better. And it depends on the media reporting on new politicians and better politicians. Um, there's just one last thing that I'd like to say. Um, I didn't uh, do um, an acknowledgement to country, and I thank Tim um, for doing uh, that a little bit before we started. Um, just very quickly, uh, when I first started campaigning uh, with Simon Shape, I think it was, uh, every campaign that I've ever run, I ask uh, for permission from the Nambri and none of all people to campaign on their land. Uh, I've kept it to myself and hadn't wanted to politicise um, uh, that fact. But I think it's now time, seen as uh, this is, I think, my fourth or fifth election um, campaign, to invite uh, candidates um, to join me in um, coming together with a document to ask to campaign on... Um, the original people's land. Uh, so thank you very much. Let's work together, even though we don't agree with each other on everything. Let's work together. We need to maintain our rage and enthusiasm. Thank you.